AP 120, Chapter 7, Topics, Bones of Verbal Column and Thoracic Cage. So, to start with, we have the hyoid bone. Hyoid bone is found in the throat region. It is superior to the larynx, sometimes thought of as being part of the larynx. Uh, the hyoid bone has a lot of attachment sites for muscles related to the tongue. So it's important for swallowing. And uh, it is the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone. It does not form a joint with another bone. Here's the hy hyoid bone, nice and U-shaped. All right, the vertebral column. The vertebral column uh, is the backbone, as it were. It is a long structure going from the neck all the way down to the buttocks. And what does it do? Well, it supports the head and trunk of the body. Uh, protects the spinal cord, which is very important. It helps to cushion, say, impacts, say, if you sit down kind of hard. And it also is important in posture. The muscles for posture pull on the vertebral column. Now, there are um, a bunch of different categories for the bones found in the vertebral column. We have the seven cervical vertebrae in the neck region, the 12 thoracic vertebrae in the chest region, the five lumbar vertebrae toward the um, abdominal area, the sacrum, and the coccyx. These are all bones of the vertebral column. And one way you can remember how many cervical vertebra, thoracic vertebra, and lumbar vertebra there are is to think breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you have a nice early 7 o'clock a.m. breakfast, seven cervical vertebrae, have lunch at noon, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and then a nice early dinner at Five, five lumbar vertebrae, sacrum coccyx. Now between each vertebra is a thick piece of fibrocartilage called the intervertebral disc. So these are cartilaginous joints between the vertebra and this intervertebral disc is important because it helps to provide that cushion effect so that the bones don't clank together if we sit down hard. There's also a hole called the intervertebral foramen that you can only see when you have two vertebra coming together, articulating together. And the intervertebral foramen is where the spinal nerves leave the vertebral column. All right, when we look at the vertebra, we see that it has some natural curvature to it. And so there are five curves. There is the cervical curvature in the neck, that pushes out anteriorly, the thoracic curvature in the upper back pushing out posteriorly, the lumbar curvature in the lower back pushing out anteriorly, and then the sacral curvature uh, in the buttocks area. So four curvatures to this curvy verbal column. Now it is possible to have uh, health issues related to the curvature of the verbal column. For instance, there is a disorder called kyphosis, kyphosis or hunchback, where there's an exaggerated posterior curvature to the thoracic vertebrae. Um, this is often seen in elderly people, but it can happen in other people too. Then we have lordosis or swayed back. Lordosis is an exaggerated curvature to the lumbar vertebrae. And um, while lordosis can be caused in someone who's pregnant, it turns out it can be caused for other reasons as well. And often uh, it makes the person look a little pregnant because their abdominal organs are being pushed out anteriorly. Then we have scoliosis. Blah. Scoliosis. Scoliosis is abnormal lateral curvature to the vertebra, often in the thoracic area. This leads to back problems and uh, often needs to be corrected, possibly with surgery or braces. All right, here is a generic vertebra. Again, this is an irregular bone and generic vertebra. There are structures that we find on almost every vertebra. Uh, to start with, there's this big block of bone tissue. This is the body. So the body and the intervertebral disc would be lying on top of the body. There's this large opening called the vertebral foramen. That's where we find the spinal cord. Uh, then we have uh, these processes, these pointy bits sticking out laterally, these are the transverse processes. 
And then we have a process sticking out posteriorly, that's the spinous process. If you go and, and feel along the middle of your back and feel all those bumps, those are actually the spinous processes of your vertebra that you're feeling. Then we have a, a small bit of bone tissue sticking up superiorly that forms a joint with the vertebra above it. Those are the superior articular processes. And then, you can't see it, but there's also two small bits of bone tissue sticking inferiorly. Uh, the inferior articular processes that form joints with the vertebra below. Now, the cervical ver vertebra, the first seven vertebra, have uh, a couple of distinct characteristics. Uh, one thing is they're very small compared to the other vertebra. Other thing is they have these openings in their transverse processes. And these openings are called the transverse foramen. So all cervical vertebra have transverse foramen. So you have vertebra with these extra holes, it's a cervical vertebra. And some cervical vertebra, not all, but some have a spinous process that forms a fork at the end. This is called a bifid, bi for two, bifid spinous process. Now, the very first cervical vertebra, known as C1 or atlas, atlas is the very first cervical vertebra. As you can see, it looks a little different from the other cervical vertebra. It doesn't have a body, it doesn't have a spinous process, uh, but it does have the um, transverse foramen. And it has these two depressions uh, that are nice and smooth that fit the occipital condyles of the occipital bone. So the joint that uh, where the skull connects to the vertebral column are found right here. And these joints allow us to move our heads so that we can nod yes. Uh, below the at atlas is the axis. So here is the axis or C2, the second cervical bone. And it has a unique structure called the DINs. The DINs is a piece of bone tissue sticking up superiorly that helps to form a joint, a pivot joint with the atlas. And this joint between the atlas and the DINs um, allows us to turn our head so that we shake it no. We can nod no because of the pivot joint formed with the DINs of the axis and the atlas. Here is showing you the atlas on top, the axis on bottom. Here's the dens and that pivot joint. Thoracic vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae, a little bit larger than cervical vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae have extra facets on them. They have uh, extra facets on their transverse processes and also on their bodies. And this is so that they can form articulations with the ribs. So all thoracic vertebra form joint, form articulations with ribs. And this is why there are extra facets on the body and transverse processes of thoracic vertebra. See those extra facets? It's a thoracic vertebra. So here we see the thoracic vertebra. Here is the rib forming a joint with the body of the thoracic vertebra as well as the transverse process. And then a second vertebra would sit down on top, and that would be another joint formed with the rib. So that means a rib articulates three times with two adjacent vertebra. Three times with two adjacent vertebra. And then lumbar vertebra. Lumbar vertebra are the biggest because they hold up the most weight. And that's it. That's all their specialness. No extra facets, no extra holes, just bigger. So if you see a random vertebra and you want to know which category it fits in, look for extra holes. It has transverse foramen, it's cervical. Looks for extra facets. It has these extra facets, then it is a thoracic vertebra. And if neither of those things are present, it's a lumbar vertebra. All right, here is the sacrum, a largest sort of triangular shaped bone. It is a fusion of five Vertebra, so five vertebra fused together to form the sacrum. And it has these uh, small bits of bone tissue sticking up superiorly, the superior articular processes that are articulating with the last of the lumbar vertebrae, uh, L5. Inferior to the sacrum is the coccyx. Coccyx is a small little bone. A uh, fusion of four small vertebra form the coccyx. And it's a little tailbone. 
All right, the thoracic cage. Thoracic cage, the rib cage, protecting the organs in our thoracic cavity, heart, lungs, and so forth. Plays some role in breathing because all this extra cartilage here allows it to expand a little bit when we breathe in deep. And it supports the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle, the uh, clavicle, uh, forms joints with the sternum here. So the sternum or breastbone, anterior bone of the thoracic cage, it's relatively flat bone, comes in three parts, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The superior to inferior, manubrium, body, xiphoid process. Then we have 12 pairs of ribs, 12 ribs on each side. And they are named by their number. So rib one, rib two, rib three, rib four, rib five, et cetera, all the way down. And the ribs are connected to the sternum, many of them by costal cartilage. So this cartilage here, this hyaline cartilage, helps connect ribs to the sternum. Now the first seven pairs of ribs are called the true ribs. They are true ribs because they connect directly to the sternum via that cartilage. Then we have the false ribs, which are pairs 8 through 12, 8 through 12. And so they either connect indirectly by having their cartilage go into the cartilage of rib 7, or they don't attach at all. So the false ribs either attach indirectly by going into the cartilage of rib 7, or they don't attach at all. And then rib pairs 11 and 12, they are also known as floating ribs because they do not attach to the sternum at all. Floating ribs do not attach at all. So 1 through 7 true ribs, 8 through 12 false ribs, 11 and 12 floating ribs. And that is it for this part of chapter 7.